Welcome everyone. And uh, thanks for coming on this Friday afternoon. John knows about Berkeley time because in 1996, John showed up here from Chapel Hill, North Carolina to start his graduate career. And uh, he got his PhD here at Berkeley and worked closely with Eric and Henry and Merrill and myself, and uh, we all benefited very much from that, and especially me, who was a free writer and a few articles with John. So I really thank you for that. And really thank you for coming. John came, yesterday was his last day of classes at Vanderbilt, where he's teaching now. Got on a plane and rolled in here about midnight, I think, or something like that. And here he is. So it's a pleasure to have John here. Let me just say a little bit about his career, which I think is familiar to many of us. He really is a leading scholar of American politics, and he's going to speak today about his new book written with Lynn Vavrick and somebody else, I think. Yeah. And um, it's called The Bitter End, the 2020 Presidential Campaign and the Challenge to American Democracy. Lynn and he also co-authored Identity Crisis, the 2016 Presidential Campaign and the Battle for the Meaning of America. Very long titles here, John. And then the 2012 campaign was called The Gamble, Choice and Chance in the 2012 Elections. He's also the author of an excellent book, if you want to teach about campaigns and media effects and so forth, called Campaigns and Elections, Rules, Reality, Strategy, and Choice. And he's published multiple articles in all the top uh top journals i like to kid john with these three books he's sort of the theodore h white of the modern era and one of the reasons one can say that is because he is an excellent writer and these books are just very well written and easy to read and easy to follow one last thing about john is that he is the founder and now serves as the publisher of the monkey cage which is a site about political science and politics which is at the Washington Post. And it, he created an opportunity for a lot of political science and colleagues to speak truth to power or pretend to speak truth to power anyway. And it's a wonderful site to learn about the relationship between ongoing research and the news of the day. So that's another accomplishment. Uh, John, as I said, got his BA from North Carolina, his PhD from here. He now teaches at Vanderbilt University, but previously, taught at the University of Texas, Austin, and George Washington. So it's really great to have you here, John, and we're really looking forward to it. It's, it's, it's uh, so lovely to be here and to, to honor the, the Citrin Center and all the work that Jack has done um, as a researcher and teacher here, including the work that he did um, uh, whipping me into shape when I was 22 years old and showed up in his class and thought I knew more than I really new. Um, and it's really a pleasure to be um, in the room also with with Henry Brady, who chaired my dissertation. Um, anything good about that dissertation is is mainly because of Henry. Um, he forced me to to um, to read a lot of the classic work in campaigns, which I think is still very relevant today. Merrill taught me a whole semester on voting behavior um, based on his book um, with Warren Miller and a bunch of other readings on which he would bring in every week in massive stacks of photocopies and hand to us. Um, and Eric Schickler as well, where are you, Eric? Um, there you are. Uh, so Eric showed up on campus right about the same time I did or a year after. And so I'm really grateful to those folks and to everyone who was my friend or supporter here. Uh, it meant a lot to me to be here and it means a lot to me to be, here, to be back here today. So I wanna talk a little bit about the book that Jack mentioned, um, uh, which is available for pre-order on amazon.com. Uh, and should be out by the fall, um, called The Bitter End with uh, uh, Lynn Vavrick and, and Chris Dasanovich, um, who deserve a lot of credit for bringing this book across the finish line and, and contributing a lot of great data products to it. Um, and if they were here, we might mostly agree on what I'm going to say, which would be a it's pretty significant achievement. If you can get the co-authors on about 80% agreement, um, that's enough to write a book, it turns out. Um, as Jack mentioned, there's, there's two other books in this, um, I guess we'll call it a series, and the goal here with these books, just to say something very briefly, was to write a book about an election that tells the story of that election, tells you why that election turned out the way that it did, but to do so from the vantage point of social science, use the tools and the ideas from political science in particular 
um, but write it in a way that is at least modestly accessible. Um, and I actually owe people like Jack and Henry a great debt of thanks um, for showing me how to write clearly and engagingly um, about politics. Um, the way that I like to describe these books is, you know, if you were read a journalistic account of a campaign, it would be really fun to read because it's got lots of good gossip about what happened on the campaign trail. Our books are really light on gossip, but they're really heavy on graphs. And so if you like graphs, this is the book for you. Um, and you'll see that today because I have too many graphs to show you. Um, I just want to show you quickly what I want to talk about. Um, the book is grounded in, I think, four basic ideas or features of American politics and elections, which will be familiar to most of you, um, that I think inform the way we think about this election, but more about elections more generally. Um, I'll introduce this briefly, talk more in more detail about our story about 2020, um, both why Biden won, but why it was so close, unexpectedly close in the eyes of many, um, disturbingly close, maybe depending on your point of view. Um, and then because I know I'm gonna be out of time at that point, I'm gonna have only one slide on the challenge to American democracy that's in the subtitle. Um, that's an entire chapter of the book, but probably too much for one talk today. Um, so very quickly on these, these features that we um, talk about and, and sort of orient the book around. Um, one of which is, uh, I don't know if the earthquake metaphor is too sensitive for the Bay Area, but this is, uh, we call them the tectonic shifts of American politics. Um, sometimes travel under the, the heading of polarization um, or other similar terms, which are these longer term increases in the differences between the two parties. Um, and those differences, not present on every issue, certainly, but on many issues, you can see um, the Republican Party and Democratic Party differing, particularly on issues related to the size and scope of government activity and regulation of markets and things like that. Um, a simple way that you can tell that Americans perceive that there are these differences is this longstanding question in the American National Election Study, um, which asks people, you know, if there are um, important differences between the Republicans and Democrats, and the percentage of Americans who thought that as of 2020 was 90%, um, something like almost twice what it was when the question was first asked in 1952, and, and quite significantly higher even than was true um, in the early 2000s, for example. Um, in addition to these long-term tectonic shifts, you know, tectonic in the sense of, you know, kind of slow moving, right, gradually accruing, um, there are a related set of shifts that we refer to as identity shocks. These happen, have happened over a much shorter term. They have also created differences between the parties, but the differences are predominantly on issues that have to do with identity, by which we um, mean issues that are tied up with race, um, ethnicity, nationality, um, to some extent gender, religion. So these are issues that you know, we'll be familiar with, particularly immigration, civil rights, um, uh, race and policing. And it's not that there were no such differences. Eric wrote a whole book identifying how these differences began to emerge in the 1930s. But if you look at public opinion, the timing of these differences when they emerged is oftentimes much more recent. Um, and in particular, those differences accelerated um, extraordinarily under the Trump administration. Um, so what when you think about the parties sorting on these issues, like that is a much more like, like decade long phenomenon, maybe even five or year phenomenon, depending on the specific survey question that you're looking at. I'll show you one example. Um, Gallup has asked for a long time, whether you want to increase or decrease immigration levels or keep them at the same level. Um, Gallup asked that question for the first time in 1965, right around the time of the 1965 Immigration Act. I'm showing you here the percentage you said increased. And you can see there's just no difference between Democrats and Republicans on that question for decades. Um, finally, beginning in the 2000s, you get a modest partisan difference that begins to emerge. Um, by the last poll that was conducted before Trump's inauguration, there's about a 19 percentage point gap in the percentage in the, between Democrats and Republicans who, who wants to increase immigration. Uh, and then you can see what happened to the Democratic Party under Trump. Um, the American public is now more pro-immigrant than it's ever been in its history, at least in the history of polling. Um, and that is largely because Democrats don't want to say things that sound like things that Donald Trump says, as far as we can tell. And another way to think about this is the amount of polarization that has occurred in four or five years, um, in the last four or five years, is greater than all the polarization that had occurred to that point. So that's what I mean. This is not tectonic, right? This is very specific, very short term. Um, 
and very much tied to, I think, the both to some extent to Obama, depending on the question, but also to especially to the Trump era. Um, the third idea was what we refer to as a, as, a, as a more calcified politics, calcification in the sense, like the biomedical sense of the term, um, people stuck where they are, not likely to move, not likely to defect. That's the natural consequence of the first two of these features, we think. Um, and then finally, because when we say calcified politics, people often think, well, then nothing changes. Well, of course, a lot of things change, like who controls the House changes, who controls the Senate changes, who controls the White House changes. It changes a lot, right, Re very frequently now. Um, and that is because we live in an era, um, we're not the first, pe first people to say this, obviously, um, Francis Lee and Mofi Arena and others have written about just the extent to which the two parties are at relative parity. Um, that's true in the national electorate, certainly. Um, which means that the, the small shifts that sometimes do occur, even in a relatively calcified era, are enormously consequential. And they are the difference between a Trump re-election and a Biden election, for example. Um, so those are the four things that I, that'll sort of float through the talk and, and, and float through the book as well. Um, to do the 2020 election, I'll tackle the sort of why did winner win and the loser lose question first, and then we'll talk a little bit about why it's so close. Um, uh, why Trump lost in a nutshell, um, his campaign has not reached out to us to ask us what we think, but if we were talking to them, um, and in fact, if I could get the like Republican caucus in the room, I would tell them, like, this is what you're, this is what happened and what you might be dealing with again in 2024. Um, he's chronically unpopular from the very moment he steps in the White House. He has a political opportunity because of the pandemic. I mean, I don't mean to trivialize the pandemic by referring to it as a political opportunity, but it absolutely was. Um, and he squanders it. And then he doesn't get to rely on what he could rely on in 2016, which was facing a relatively unpopular opponent. Biden's not that. He's a relatively popular politician, even in an era of polarization at that point in time. Um, so you guys have probably seen these graphs of Trump's approval rating, but it's really instructive, I think, to put like Trump's approval rating against the, the first term approval of all the elected presidents since Eisenhower. So not Johnson or Ford, but the elected presidents. Um, and this is net approval. So this is percent approved minus percent disapproved. So anything below zero means more people dislike you than like you. All right, so you can see with just the orange line there that Trump is never above, never above 50%, the only president in the history of Poland, never broke 50% or never broke zero, right, in net approval, never went to positive numbers. Um, and, you know, of course, remarkably stable, right, as people noted throughout his presidency, right? Not a lot of ups and downs, the big swings that accompany the presidents because of economic trends or because of war, whether it makes you popular or unpopular. Um, Trump was not like that at all. All right. So from the, from the, and, and he had almost no honeymoon, none of that sort of initial, like Obama had 65% approval when he first took office, right? Now that didn't last clearly, but still, and he, Trump gets none of that as well. So he is, that is this, that is this, like the central dominant, dominant feature of the entire four years of Trump's presidency. He had an opportunity to do something different. Um, national crises like the pandemic present politicians opportunities to capitalize on them the way that 9-11 that was a political opportunity for George W. Bush. Um, and when the data on Trump's approval rating overall and his handling of the pandemic in particular show, right, is a moment where that was possible. And then a moment that he just chose to abandon. Um, this is the gray line is his overall approval rating and the polling average is, um, this is, I just used 538s for the purposes of illustration and then his um, COVID approval rating. And so we'll just focus on January, um, basically through the end of the campaign. Sometimes we forget that there was a moment, it didn't last very long in March, where Trump took the pandemic seriously. He, we, know he, he took, we know he knew what it was because he told Bob Woodward that in February, but he don't, chose to say something different in public. But in March, he changed his tune. He declared a national emergency. He issued guidelines to states and localities that included many of the COVID mitigation measures that we became familiar with. He told his son, it was, he said he told his son it was gonna be very bad. He said it was gonna be, a, I mean, what's the Trump phrase? Um, hell of a bad two weeks was another Trump quote from that period. And so there's a moment when he does that and his approval rating, as was noted at the time, bounces up from its usual position in the low 40s to something more like 45 or 46 percentage points, hardly a sea change, but also something that was difficult to come by for Donald Trump. His COVID handling rating also goes up. 
And you guys, of course, will remember that Trump couldn't stick with that message for very long. And by the middle of April, he thought that we should reopen the country. Um, and he called for that um, in his public remarks and then followed that the next day with the famous tweets targeting the Democratic governors of states like Michigan and Virginia, which said in all caps, liberate Michigan, right? Liberate Virginia. And of course, there were armed protesters in the state capitol in Michigan, right? So, you know, Trump sort of throws that uh, approach to the pandemic aside and then never really changes his tune. Um, he, is a, he continues to criticize governors, both Republicans and Democrats, who pursue more stringent measures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so you can see what happens as a consequence of this. His COVID approval rating starts to go down. After a spell, his overall approval rating also goes down. And so by the summer of 2020, his overall approval rating is slightly lower than it was when the pandemic starts. And only um, over the course of the end of the summer and the fall does it begin to sort of tick upward and then it only gets back basically to where it was in January. And let me just to say like that it doesn't have to be this way. Right? Look at year four for Obama, right? Increase in approval rating. Look at year four for George W. Bush, increase in approval rating. Clinton, increase in approval rating. Even George H. W. Bush, right? Gets at least some bounce back by the very end of the campaign. Nixon's approval rating goes up. Carter, mm, not so much, right? That's you know, telling. Um, Reagan's approval rating goes up. They all go up, right? Presidents oftentimes use the campaign as an opportunity to present a positive case about their presidency and they benefit from it. And Trump can't do that, right? And the thing that might've enabled him to do that, he just doesn't stick there. So, and I can, we can show you that this also is not like something that was true for all leaders. So we have public opinion data on approval of all these different world leaders. Let's just set everybody's net approval rating at zero in January of 2020, right? And just, let's see where it goes in terms of change, right? So if you do that, right, you see Trump in orange. Start, we set it at zero mechanically, but it doesn't really vary much from zero. But look at Scott Morrison of Australia or Angela Merkel in Germany, Justin Trudeau in Canada, Macron in France, Narendra Modi, Boris Johnson, and Bolsonaro. Now, Bolsonaro and Modi famously don't take the pandemic very seriously, don't benefit much. Johnson does for a while and then pivots and tries to reopen and has the same decline in his approval rating that Trump experienced, but to a larger scale. But there were leaders who did take the pandemic more seriously, including ones that weren't exactly popular to begin with, like Macron, and they got more popular. And it didn't last necessarily at the same level, like look at Trudeau, for example, in the upper right. But still, like by the end of the fall, Trump, I mean, Trudeau is still more popular than he was before the pandemic. And we can show this with governors, same thing, particularly Democratic governors and the Republican governors who took it seriously, Hogan, Charlie Baker in Massachusetts, et cetera. So again, when I say it was an opportunity, I'm not, I'm, it was. Like, it's not as if we're, in, we're, we're, we're treating Trump to a standard that was unattainable, right? It was attainable, but it was one that Trump chose not to pursue. Then he confronts Biden, okay? Now it's easy right now to think of Biden as kind of a loser, right? Because his approval rating is down and the country is struggling and you're getting all the usual media coverage of that. But what was true during the campaign is that Biden was relatively popular and he became more popular as the campaign went on. Um, the, the big survey project that Lynn and Chris helped to organize this year called Nationscape, we interviewed 6,000 or 6,500 respondents a week between January, July 2019 and January 2021. It's a sample of 500,000 people. So we have, I mean, in the tradition that Henry helped establish where you, you really try to get these granular surveys over time, um, we can chart both um, Biden and Trump's favorability rating. This is net favorability. So this is percent favorable minus percent unfavorable. So again, positive numbers are good. Trump, of course, is down in negative numbers as he is in approval. And his, if anything, the events beginning in April with his insistence that we reopen um, and perhaps also his reaction to the murder of George Floyd drive his favorability rating lower. And, and to the extent that it recovers, it's maybe only slightly better at the very end of the survey uh, before the, camp the election than it was in January. Biden's approval rating moves up and down, you know, in response to events in the way you might think, you know, a poor showing in the Iowa caucus drives it down, a better showing in South Carolina brings it back up. He loses some ground in the spring. That's when Republicans discover they should have a less favorable view of him. That's almost all that trend is driven by Republicans. He gains ground in the fall, 
when Democrats come to have a more favorable view of him. This is the classic like partisan rally. This is in the old research that Henry made me read about, you know. Uh, but in that, the end of that story, right, is that Trump is at minus 10 and Biden's at basically at plus 10. So there's no way to rely on the long history of Hillary Clinton, you know, her, her tangled relationship with the news media and all the other factors that I think helped to create, make her a less popular political figure in 2016. You know, she would have been about where Trump was. Um, she was about where Trump was um, in 2020. He was even less popular in 2016, but she was about where he was in 2020. So, I mean, that's the story, I think, in a nutshell. And just, just to show you the importance of this, um, take Trump's approval rating in June, just as an example. And you sleep, let's use that as a forecast. Let's just say, like, how do presidents do in the, how do incumbent parties especially do in the popular vote um, when their party's president is polling at 40% in June of 2020? Um, we can, you can look at that relationship over time and the kind of traditional scatter plot that we use where the president's approval rating is on the horizontal axis, the incumbent party's share of the major party vote is on the vertical axis. Obviously, there's an upward sloping line because you would expect the incumbent party to do better when the incumbent president's popular. But 2020 is not particularly surprising based on that relationship. Um, June is arbitrary to be clear, but we just use June because you, you're trying to pick something that's not like, oh, let's look at his approval rating on the day before the election. Like, let's, let's do a forecasting exercise here. All right, so that tells you that, that Trump's popularity was, you know, in some sense, pretty consistent with how well he did. Um, it also tells you that Trump's popularity, popularity rating was not so bad that you should ex have expected Biden to win by the landslide that the polls predict. But nevertheless, right, this is the consequence of being a chronically unpopular president who cannot leverage the pandemic to improve on his situation. Um, he loses an election. That, in some sense, is a very straightforward, ordinary political science story. But I think that is also probably a pretty good story for the case of Trump. Why the election was so close is maybe more interesting. Um, there's a lot of things happening here. Um, we think of the economic conditions of the country in 2020 as actually somewhat ambiguous electorally. Um, and they didn't clearly hurt Trump, as you can tell from a stable approval rating. You can see the calcification and how few differences there were between 2016 and 2020. And that's true at the state level, it's true at the county level, it's true at the level of individual voters. The identity shocks only intensify even though people thought that George Floyd and the racial justice protests might be a watershed or a sea change in the way that Americans thought about civil rights, the circumstances of black Americans. And then finally, we can show that these ongoing tectonic shifts are at work. And the tectonic shifts, polarization and the like mean that there are gains and losses for both candidates, right? So it's not just a story of Biden benefiting and Trump not benefiting. Um, so let me talk a little bit about economic conditions. Again, this will probably jog your memory in terms of what happened. Because of the pandemic, obviously we had a punishing recession that started um, in the first quarter of, of uh, 2000. That is visible right, in very sharp contractions right, of gross domestic product. Um, when you plot the whole trend in gross domestic product um, since 1947, right, you see you know, a lot of years where the quarter over quarter growth is positive. Then you see where the recessions, like the Great Recession, the financial crisis, where of course the economy contracts. But what's remarkable, of course, was the second quarter contraction on a non-annualized basis is almost nine percentage points. Nothing like that had ever been recorded. It is also worth noting that that bounced back pretty significantly in the third quarter. The net, right, is a still contraction, still a recession, okay? But nevertheless, right, it's, it's, there's some sense of maybe upward trend. The other data point, this is one Gabe knows well, um, I remember you tweeting about this, um, was the trend in people's incomes which of course went up the opposite direction because of the stimulus payments that the government provided. And also at, an, at, a, at a level that was un, unprecedented, right? So this is the quarterly real disposable income in 2012 dollars, it's 1947 through the third quarter of 2020. And you can see that, that little notch up, right? Between 45.7 and, and 50,000, right? That's the impact. And nothing like that had ever happened in this time trend. You, it's very hard to see. There's a slight tick at the down tick at the end, but still people are much better off, right? Their savings, and there's lots of other data that shows their savings increased, right? They, you know, we couldn't spend money on a lot of stuff that we'd ordinarily spend money on. So 
right? So what do you do, right? When you have a, a simultaneously a, a recession, an economic contraction and people's incomes go up. Well, it's not gonna surprise you that people's economic evaluations look a little bit murky. So the, the index that we've often relied on is the University of Michigan's Index of Consumer Sentiment. It's based on five questions that ask you how you feel about your personal finances and business conditions in the recent past, how you expect those things to do in the near future. And also a fun question that they have to include for the sake of continuity about whether it's a good time to make large purchases like dishwashers or washing machines. Um, at least it doesn't say like a good time to, you know, like, I don't know, phonographs or something like that, but still. Um, that's a scale that, you know, it doesn't have percentage point value, but it just goes from like lower numbers mean um, less economic confidence, higher numbers mean more economic confidence. And this is the time trend in the history of that scale. Um, I've done a couple things here for you. I've marked the recessions in orange to show you where like the downturns were, and you can see the consumer sentiment um, ticking downward during those periods. The, the white circles mark the October of the election year. And I just want to draw your attention to, to the end point, right, where, where consumer sentiment sat at the end of 2020. Okay, it's lower than it was in October of 2016, but it's not much different than it was in October of 2012, when Barack Obama was reelected as an incumbent president. Okay. So it is, it's clearly not where it was in October of 2008, when George W. or when McCain is defeated in part because of what had happened to Bush. So again, those are worse evaluations than would have happened if there had been no pandemic and no economic contraction, but they're not exactly right, at the level that we would think of as being clearly a harbinger of like a devastating defeat for the incumbent party. So economically <laughs> ambiguous. And even if, you don't, even if you think that still means something, people's views of Trump didn't change. Right, so I've, we've showed this in our other work, but if you, if you, you, would not, you would typically expect a positive association between consumer sentiment in any given quarter and how well the president is evaluated in that quarter. And that was true from Kennedy through George W. Bush, and it stopped with Obama, and it stopped with Trump. It's actually continued with Biden, but that's a different talk. Okay, All right. But here's what it looks like. Right, the gray dots are all the, or all the earlier presidents, and I put a gray line to show you that's a positive relationship, as you would expect. There are the Obama dots in blue and an Obama line, and Trump dots and a Trump line, and the Obama line and the Trump line are flat. Like, and you can see that like, Trump, there, finally there was a lot of variation in consumer sentiment because of the economic downturn. It, it didn't affect his approval rating at all. It did not matter. It didn't matter for Obama as well. There's, all, there's other published research now about this by Matt Levo, Paul Kelstead, and colleagues. Um, but we, we noted this in 2016, um, and, it, and it continued to be true in 2020, when, when 2016 through 2020. So again, like if you want the election not to be close, and you think the economic recession is the mechanism to produce that, well, it's not going to produce it if, if Trump's approval rating isn't really movable on the basis of these economic conditions. Now, and there's, I mean, there's, there's, there's definitely some work to be done to think about why this is the case. Is it just because... The public doesn't care anymore about objective reality when they evaluate presidents in an age of partisan polarization? Or is it because the economic conditions of Obama and Trump were a little strange? And the particularly the recession under Trump wasn't really something like that was his quote fault. I mean, it was clearly like, you know, an act of God type, you know, event. All those are relevant questions. But nevertheless, this is, I think, one reason why the election ends up being pretty close because Trump's approval rating doesn't depend very much on people's views of the, econ of the economy. Um, let's talk about what calcification looks like in 2020. The one way to do this is to look at the state level. Um, and we like to do this by comparing pa pa pairs of adjacent elections. Like so what had the states vote in 2008 versus 2012? What about 12 versus 16? What about 16 versus 20? Well, when we did this in the gamble, it looked like this. This is Obama and two-party vote. 2008 and all the different states, some of which we've labeled, and this is how he did in 2012, right? And the diagonal line is at the 45 degree angle, and so if all the dots were on the line, then he would be doing exactly the same in both years. Well, all the, most of the dots, except for Alaska, because Sarah Palin wasn't on the ticket in 2012, um, are below the line, which means that Obama is doing less well in 12 than he was in 2008. And that's the natural consequence of being the out party running against the incumbent in the middle of a punishing recession versus being the incumbent running in some modest economic growth. Notice all the dots move in the same direction for the most part. Okay, so it's kind of a uniform shift to some extent. 2012 to 2016. 
a very different story. So in identity crisis, we showed this picture. And we said, first of all, several things are happening here. First of all, the spread of the dots, right, is much larger. The absolute value of the shifts is much larger. Uh, to be precise, it's um, 2.5 here and it's 3.3 there. Moreover, there are dots above and below the line. Trump does better in places famously like Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan. Um, but Obama, excuse me, Clinton does better than Obama, not just in Utah because of no Romney, right? But also in Texas, Arizona, Georgia, et cetera. Um, and in identity crisis, we showed that this was very well predicted by the percentage of the state that is a white non-college voter, um, as opposed to white college or non-white voters. So these states like Texas, Arizona, Georgia, obviously these shifts are harbingers of things that are coming in 2020 as well. That's because those states have different demographics than the quote unquote so-called Rust Belt, which also used to be called the blue law states and the upper Midwest. So that is, I think, um, a very different pattern that involves some of the reshuffling of the party coalitions that took place in that election year. But when you get to comparing 2016 to 2020, now we're back to a picture that looks more like the first one. Biden does a little bit better than Clinton in almost every state. That's the difference between having a four point or 4.4 4 point popular vote margin versus Clinton's two, two point popular vote margin. And it's true in almost every state. The, the shifts again are pretty uniform, pretty similar. So what's happened in 2016 to rearrange things is already baked in. Right, we're, not go, we're not having a similarly rearranging kind of election, I'm not calling it realigning in, in particular, I'm not going to put my foot in that thicket, right, but rearranging, you know. So again, like, even despite all of the events of the election year, everything that happens in 2020, all the drama, right, it's not really doing much other than just creating these small uniform shifts, enough to get a different party's president elected, but nevertheless, right, something that was, I think, not what the, the dramatic events themselves would suggest. What about at the county level? Let's take the absolute difference in county shifts from adjacent pairs of elections. And we can graph this back a long way, back to 1952. Okay, so again, take the shift between, this would be 48 and 52 in each county, take the absolute value, average it together. It's about 13 percentage points. Okay, we've lived in a long era, right, of smaller and smaller county level shifts. But in 2016, right, it notched up because of that rearranging that was going on. Um, the county level shift, average county level shift in 2016 was about 6.6 .6 points. 2020 was the lowest ever recorded. It was 1.9 percentage points of, the, of this era. Okay. Larry Bartels and others have documented the similar thing. Um, but the point is that just at the county level, there's still between 16 and 20, so much continuity and stability Right, that you're not producing the kind of large scale shifts that you might expect to see if you think you were thinking, okay, we're gonna get something big happening here. That's what, why, why we think of it as more like calcification. Um, same thing's true at the individual level. One of the data sets that we've been involved in gathering is a long-term panel survey called the Views of the Electorate Research Survey or the Voter Survey. Um, and we've been re-interviewing the same people um, since 2012. So we have the, their, their voting behaviors of 2012, 2016, and 2020. Obviously not everyone voted in all those three elections. Obviously there are voters who entered the electorate right since the survey began, uh, but nevertheless, it's still useful to take stock of what that panel data can show us. Um, this was the graph that we showed in the identity crisis, um, where of course, most Obama voters in 2012 voted for Clinton and most Romney voters voted for Trump. But of course there are the off diagonals, right? In red, five and 9%. And the 9% are the famous Obama Trump voters. And those were the ones that really, you know, helped to swing the election because they were more prevalent in places like Michigan and Pennsylvania and Ohio. Well, when we did the same thing with 16 and 20, it's just a very different story. Right? The off diagonals now are very small. Most people are loyal to their party. The implication of this, by the way, is what happened to the, 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 the Obama Trump voters, all the voters maybe that Joe Biden could win back because he's from Scranton, Pennsylvania and blah, 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 blah. 87% voted for Donald Trump. What about the Romney Clinton voters? 83% voted for Biden. So they were the swing voters of 16 and by 2020, they're reliable partisans. So that's, again, there's just not much happening now at, the, at any of these levels. It's very, I mean, you know, stable. And again, that just keeps the, the outcome, right, from being, I think, the, the landslide that many Democrats hoped it would be. Um, I'm gonna show you just one slide that's relevant to the concept of identity shock that has to do with um, 
our, we have a whole chapter on George Floyd in the aftermath. We have nationscape data that charts week by week what happened to public opinion after um, Floyd's murder. I'm gonna show you data from the, from the panel survey though, just to give you a snapshot of what is true. Um, in, the, in the panel, um, thanks to Michael Tesler, we had the good sense to ask people's evaluations of the Black Lives Matter, Matter movement and their evaluations of the police in November, 2016, after that election cycle. And then we could, we, we, when we asked them the same questions again in September 20, 2020, this is what we found. Um, this is views of the police um, on a zero to 100 scale, um, a, a standard feeling thermometer. Um, Republican views, um, which did move a little bit um, week by week after the George Floyd uh, murder, basically returned to their previous level. And that's what the, pa the panel data is picking up with the snapshot. But of course, both independents and Democrats had much less favorable views, although they're not necessarily completely unfavorable views. Um, so again, an identity shock in our telling is when partisanship becomes more aligned with your views on identity inflected issues. Now partisanship is more aligned with your views of the police. What about Black Lives Matter? It's the same story. There was a small um, increase in people's uh, positivity towards that movement as a consequence of Floyd's murder. But by and large, that's not present among Republicans very soon after um, Floyd was murdered and by the end of the, the fall when the voter survey is in the field, Republicans' views are, if anything, slightly less um, positive and Democrats' views are significantly more positive. Um, for those of you who are curious, almost all of this opinion change, this identity shock opinion change between 16 and 20 is party-driven issue attitude change. Gabe, that's for you. Um, right? It is people updating their issue attitudes but keeping their partisanship the same. In 2016, there was definitely there were definitely people who shifted their vote choice. Right, the, the Obama Trump voter was a racially conservative white voter, the modal one was a racially conservative white voter who shifted from Obama to Trump. Right, they moved their vote choice to align with their issue attitudes. Almost all the change that we find between 16 and 20 is different. It's partisans updating their issue attitudes, particularly Democrats. Okay, that's true on immigration as well as it's true on these racial issues. And again, the, 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 the contrast in the book is we say, people thought this was gonna be a watershed. I can, we have quotes to that effect. I have positive quotes about George Floyd and negative quotes about the police from Mitch McConnell, from Tom Cotton, from Rush Limbaugh, all that goes out the window by the summer of 2020, right? And what's replaced is, right, a set of ideas and messages that reinforce partisan divisions rather than creating some degree of new consensus on how we need to approach issues related to the rights of black Americans and policing. And as a consequence, we don't get anything that looks like a reckoning. We don't get a shift, okay? So in some sense, the identity shock story, when sometimes when people ask me, what is your book about? I'm like, well, more of the same, you know, cause it's kind of, in fact, that's part of the title of this chapter uh, cause it's, that's kind of what's true, okay. So then let's talk about the last component of our story, which has to do with um, these tectonic shifts in this broader process of polarization. Um, one of the things that we observed in the, in the public opinion data from 2020 was that people perceived Trump and Biden to, to be more different ideologically than they perceived Trump and Clinton, okay? So, and the, the American National Election Study had a panel where people were re-interviewed in 16 and 20. So we're gonna take advantage of those, that, that data sets, the same people, asked the same questions four years apart. They, they're asked to place Biden and Trump on scales, okay? Measuring where they think they are on these different issues. So like how liberal or conservative do you think Trump is? So we're gonna rescale that to go from zero to 100 to make it simple, simple. And I'll show you what those averages look like. This is the question that just asks you to place them on a scale that, that is labeled liberal to conservative. It's not, it doesn't have any issue content, it's just the labels, right? So people's labeling of Biden on that scale, the average was similar to where they had put Clinton. Again, these are the same people. But their perception of Trump was that he was much more conservative. And that's true in other polling data that we were able to locate. Uh, and this connects to an earlier chapter of the book where we talk about Trump as being a fairly conventional conservative Republican president not the game-changing economic populist that people thought he might be, okay? If you look at other kinds of issues, you can see that either Trump is perceived as somewhat more conservative, Biden is perceived as somewhat more liberal or both. Um, so this is a question that asks what you think the government's role in healthcare is. 
whether you think the government should guarantee jobs, and then whether you think the government should do more to um, assist with black people. Um, and for, you know, and generally speaking, right, Biden and Trump are perceived as further apart than Clinton and Trump were, despite, of course, all the things that I think Biden sought to do to sort of make himself a more moderate Democrat in a variety of ways. I think they both candidates are in some sense, right, being accurately or not, I don't know, but nevertheless are, are being perceived as sort of continuations of the tectonic shifts, right, rather than as people who disrupt those shifts or, or complicate those shifts. Um, so if you would imagine, of course, a world in which um, voters think that candidates are more ideologically distinct, it should be the case then that their own voting behavior is more polarized by ideology. Um, and that's what we find. Um, so for this analysis, we take the cooperative election study, which has large samples in 16, large samples in 20, same kinds of issue questions. And we look to see um, how well does Trump do um, with conservatives in 2020 as opposed to 2016? What about moderates? What about liberals? Like what's the net shift in each of these three groups? And I'll just, for the sake of illustration, I'll define conservatives and moderate and liberal, not by their issue attitudes, but just by what they call themselves. Um, and I can show that it's true whether you define ideology by abortion attitudes or gun attitudes or your, your overall view of racism and how big of a problem you think racism is, the same pattern holds. And it looks like this. Um, right, so positive numbers are net gain for Trump in percentage point terms. Negative numbers are net loss for Trump or net gain for Biden in percentage point terms. And you can see that Trump does about nine points better among self-identified conservatives than he does in 20, 2016. Biden does better among self-identified moderates and self-identified liberals. And that's a pattern that looks pretty consistent across different ways of measuring people's ide ideology or issue positions. And this is the story of more polarization. Um, and importantly, I think it is also a story that characterizes not just Americans overall, but it characterizes Americans of all the major ethnic and racial groups. Um, so let's take the same question, like are you conservative, moderate, liberal? How do you define yourself? Let's do the same thing. We'll break it down by um, white voters, black voters, Latino voters, and uh, Asian American voters. And it's the same thing. I mean, the magnitudes vary, right? It's, of course, it's not all exact, exactly the same story, but the same pattern holds, right? Trump does better among conservatives of all racial and ethnic groups. Um, to give you an example for Latino voters, just to give you a sense of where 23.8 comes from. In the CES data from 2016, Latino conservatives um, voted 59% Trump, 33% uh, Clinton. 2020, that's, it goes 74% Trump, 24% Biden, right? So you're losing, Biden's losing vote, Trump's gaining vote relative to what was true in 2016. Um, one of the arguments that we therefore make about how we should think about, for example, the fact that Trump did slightly better among black voters and, a, and, a, and definitely better among um, Hispanic voters in 2020. Um, there are a lot of news accounts, for example, of Latino voters that talked about, well, if you were a Latino voter in Florida who was from Venezuela or Cuba, you were concerned that the Democratic Party's shift on ideology was making it into the socialist parties that you opposed when you left those countries. But in the Rio Grande Valley, the Mexican Americans living there are reacting to the border crisis and to the fact that Biden might curtail fossil fuel expansion, which would hurt the oil drilling business. And so the, the, the news accounts that we like to argue with in these books um, were full of like very boutique explanations for the behavior of every little subgroup of, of Latino voters in the United States. And my view is not only that we need a, an explanation that it can account by the fact that Biden lost among lots of different kinds of Latino voters in lots of different kinds of places, whether we're talking about Florida, or talking about Texas, we're talking about Puerto Rican neighborhoods in you know, the Bronx or wherever, we also need an explanation if we can find one that accounts not just for Latino voters, but for other kinds of voters too. And I think this is the simplest like Occam's razor style explanation for what happened. And it's a consequence to me of the fact that people perceive ideological difference between the candidates. It's not, it's not something that's necessarily specific to particular subgroups of, of voters or to particular geographies. <laughs> I think it's a much more nationalized story than that. Um, in the last uh, chapter of the book, um, which is entitled Subversion, unfortunately, uh, we, we attend to the challenge um, to American democracy in more detail. Um, I decided for the purposes of having a talk that didn't go on for a whole hour um, to pass the mic 
on this subject to, um, to Paul Pearson and Eric Schickler, um, who had the prescience to write and publish prior to the election and prior to the insurrection, an article about the challenges that the country was facing to sort of traditional Madisonian democracy. Um, and I'll just, I just wanna quote from them about the, what hyperpartisanship means when we're trying to check authoritarian developments in government. And their comment that they made about what Republican members of Congress are facing in particular, I think of all of that is proven to be quite accurate. Um, and we document in great detail in this chapter, the extent to which all of the things that we've talked about in the book thus far are in some sense only magnified and amplified by the reaction to the events of January 6th. Again, another moment that seemed like, like COVID or like George Floyd, like it could have been a watershed. It could have been a moment of difference, right? And it did create modest differences. It created the most bipartisan impeachment vote that we've ever had of an American president. On the other hand, it's a relatively small amount of bipartisanship and everything that's happened then only magnifies it greater. Um, so I'll, I'll conclude with that and be delighted to talk about anything. Um, and it, it occurred, I have like, 15 backup slides of graphs from other parts of the book. So anything you guys want to talk about that I haven't talked about, maybe I have something I can share and, and speak to. Thank you. Guys. Mike, anyone wants to ask a question? I'll start with you, Tom, and then you next. Thanks. John. Can you tease out um, the meaning of ideology uh, and the change over time and the extent to which uh, the economy has declined in importance and other kind of cultural issues have increased? And yeah. um, well, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I think that that's right. Um, with the caveat, as I alluded to before, that the this inflationary period really does seem to have created, I think, a more a stronger connection between people's views of the economy and their views of the president. Um, and it may mean that we just hadn't had inflation for a long enough time to see that that was still true. But I think what was true for certainly for 2016 and for 2020 um, was that, uh, and I'm going to channel something that Krista Sonovich um, has said in our conversations. He said, you know, when when we have um, voting that is basically a performance-based evaluation of the president, what, what, like Gabe wrote about in his book, right? Basically, that's an assessment that's based on a shared value, right? Economic prosperity is something we all want. Um, but when the economy seems to matter less and less for how people evaluate presidents or maybe vote in presidential elections, then we're shifting, right, the terrain from things that we agree on to all the things that we disagree on. And to us, you know, ideology issues like immigration or others that we think have been consequential for 2016, certainly, you know, that's the terrain on which we can, we oftentimes fight um, or more often perhaps seem to fight. It's not that we haven't had polarizing debates in American politics prior to 2016 or 2020, um, but just that those things may be seen to be more consequential or more, more, at least more visible, more prevalent, more divisive than perhaps they were. Um, and again, I thought, you know, I thought I kind of naively thought, because sometimes when you write a book like this, you need to think positive thoughts to sort of feel better, sleep well. I thought maybe not because Biden's like some transcendent politician, but I just thought maybe we'd sort of shift, right, into sort of having a different kind of issue agenda. Um, and to be honest with you, um, not just the kind of continued politics around um, race, which would involve like public school education about racism and critical race theory, but just now we all the stuff about um, uh, the don't say gay bill in Florida, groomers, you know, just ideas that I thought of as being like, I never would have envisioned that we would have this extraordinarily like inflammatory and, and frankly homophobic conversation makes me really despair because it seems like instead of um, pivoting, right, the way that Biden I thought wanted to pivot to talk about um, issues where there was more you know, consensus or we, we could perhaps agree on infrastructure and things like that. Instead, like it's almost as if every, it's just a polarization generating machine, an idea generating machine of what's the newest thing that we can argue about. So, you know, again, it, if, if inflation doesn't improve or if consumer sentiment stays um, low and Biden is not reelected, we might tell a little bit different story. You know, we might say, well, 
The president was, the incumbent was not elected because of poor economic conditions. So I don't want to rule out the possibility that there is no retrospective voting, or I mean, I don't want to make strong claims, but I do think that a lot of what politics looks like now is, is much more about these areas of disagreement than any kind of shared ideas or values. Yes. Oh, on the topic of the issue of teasing out net changes versus the negatives or the positives within those changes, I want to be if you could direct it to two things. One is uh, Obama voters who shifted to voted for Donald Trump yep. in 2016, and that that's used by of conservative pundits as as a way of proof positive that Trump voters were not racist. Yeah. Um, is that can you can you tease out the issue there? Because I'm wondering if a lot of the people who voted for Trump in 16, who voted for Obama in 12, were not voting for Obama; they were voting against Romney or against yeah. the RNC or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's a very good question. And then and then this, that's that if you can tease out is there is there date on that? Yep. And then the second one is, um, I'm forgetting the second one. Okay, let's just stick with that. Okay. Oh, okay, I got I got it. Is, is there evidence between 16 and 20 of improvements in micro-targeting of this information that could some of the accounting for why the spread is wider between opinions of Trump and or, or where people think Trump and uh, Biden fall yeah. uh, is due to improved micro-targeting of negatives against Biden? Yeah, that's a good question. So I would say a couple of things on the, fir on the first point. Um, what we were able to show in the book about 2016 was that um, a large number of white Obama voters had views on race and ethnicity and immigration that were out of step with what Obama thought, what the Democratic Party typically thought. Um, they just hadn't really aligned those views. So these were views that, you know, they would oppose a path to citizenship for undocumented immigrants. Or they, if you ask them questions about like, the origins of racial inequality, they would tend to agree with statements that suggested that racial inequality arises because Black people don't try hard enough, as opposed to an explanation that says racial inequality is due to generations of slavery and discrimination. So, you know, statements that seem very strange, like coming from the mouth of a supporter of Barack Obama, but they were absolutely there. So what changes, I think, between 12 and 16 is that the, the 16 election, in part because of Trump, but to some extent also Clinton, right, they just center on these issues so much more right, that it, it activates people's beliefs. And so if you are a white Obama voter with those views about race and immigration, now you have a candidate explicitly and repeatedly agreeing with you. And so it becomes easier to use your positions on these issues to vote for, to choose which candidate you're voting for in 2016. So I don't think of the, I, I mean, I don't, we don't make any um, blanket characterization of Obama Trump voters as being racist or racially prejudiced. We don't use those words. We don't make that as a characterization. All we can say is that those issues became more strongly related to people's choices in 16 than they were in 12. Um, and, and that helped Trump because he was able to capitalize on these and bring these voters to, um, into his coalition. And that was the backbone of his narrow victory through the electoral college. On micro-targeting, I don't know is the answer to your question. I would say, I think, I mean, I, this is a little bit um, channeling some research that David Brockman did about Fox News that I think that there is obviously, this is not micro-targeting done by campaigns, but this is in some sense, there are a series of conservative news sources that are certainly promoting ideas about who Biden is and what Biden believes Right, that portray him to be a socialist menace um, when Biden is kind of a you know, mainstream Democrat, basically. Now, maybe I guess that's a socialist menace from the standpoint of Tucker Carlson, but still. So I do think that there are, there are messages that are floating around that are targeted at, um, you know, clearly targeted subgroups of Americans that try to play on these perceptions. Um, and I think you could argue there are similar messages about Trump come from the left, and, but they're just left-wing media sources are not as large and, and visible or viable um, as Fox News is. So I, that to me would be, the, I think, how I would talk about that. I don't know that it's a micro-targeting story from the standpoint of campaigning. There are anecdotal stories about micro-targeting information and misinformation that reached Latino voters via various kinds of social media channels in these different communities. I don't want to discount anecdotes entirely, but I, I don't yet know of any good systematic evidence showing that those that that information was consequential for their thinking. 
Henry. John, I, I want to ask you about Latino voters. Uh, I, I'm trying to understand exactly what you're saying here, because it, it looks like conservatives were more likely to vote for Trump in, in 2020 and, and liberals more likely to vote for Biden. How did that net out for Latinos? Were there conservative Latinos who basically in 2016 voted for Clinton mm -hmm. uh, and thought uh, because they didn't really know where Trump was? Yeah. And did they then change their minds that, yes, Trump was a conservative and I'm going to go with Trump? And what does that say about the future of Latino voting in the United States, yeah. given that it sounds like there's a substantial group of conservative Latino voters who might be yeah. the base for the Republican Party. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a great question. So, you know, I don't. It's I mean, I, I don't think it's easy to come up with like, um, you know, canonical absolute numbers about what percentage of Latinos are conservative, moderate, liberal. I can tell you what they how they identify themselves, and of course there are more conservatives and moderates than there are liberals. And so when you get this pattern, right, that nets out to a, a pro-Trump shift among Latinos. Um, I wouldn't want to lean on that one figure as the Rosetta Stone, right, of anything. But I do think that's what is true. Um, there are some other things that are also true of these Latinos. Um, they also, I said, we talked about this at lunch a little bit, they also tend to be Latino voters who don't strongly identify as Latino, don't have a lot of group consciousness as Latinos, don't perceive as much discrimination against Latinos. Um, so for me, for me, I think that, you know, we've known for a long time and scholars of Latino politics have written about this for, for decades, right? That Latinos are this highly heterogeneous group. Um, and I think what seems to have happened is, I mean, I would tell the story the way you told it with the caveat that we don't have the data that allows us to put a, that causal order exactly together. But I, it, does, it does seem to me to be the case, right? That there was some sort of clarified ideological stakes that then leads Latinos like other groups of Americans to vote in a more ideologically polarized way. I presume that that re reflects a shift in their perceptions followed by a shift in their behavior. But again, like being able to sort that exact story out, I don't know. What does the future suggest? I mean, I, I would be surprised if it was substantially different in the sense that I would not imagine Latinos, you know, um, coming back wholesale to the Democratic Party. There are, there's other polling data. I don't know, David or others probably could speak to this from what they see within the political community, but you know, there's other polling data that set, suggests that there are some continued challenges for Democrats. Again, it's a pro-Democratic group. They helped Biden win the presidency. They will continue to help Democrats win on net, but you just may not face the same large margins that the Democratic Party once did. Um, and I don't know if, I mean, I don't know, maybe there could be some kind of exogenous shocks or a different kind of democratic nominee that could change that, those politics at least a little bit, a co-ethnic democratic, you know, nominee or something of, the, of that kind. Um, um, but I'm, I, I'm inclined, um, again, kind of channeling what Eric and Paul wrote about in that article, to, I'm inclined to see some of these polarizing dynamics as self-reinforcing rather than assuming that these are just kind of one-off, this is a one-off from 2020 and it'll, it'll sort of revert to the equilibrium prior so that would be my best guess not a stone cold forecast but i you know that's a, that is something i don't we don't have the oh i agree with that 100 percent you could certainly imagine that's true for some of for issues like abortion or whatever but i don't i don't have a good that's would really some some a deeper kind of ethnographic account of the origins or the nature of conservatism um, there may, maybe there's some research that I'm not aware of, but, I, but of course there's a lot that's been done on the nature of ideology among African-American voters and why traditional ways of thinking about the liberal conservative spectrum really don't travel very well into the African-American community. Hakeem Jefferson at Stanford's written about this. Tasha Philpott at Texas has written about this. So I think there's some work to be done to understand ideology more in a more nuanced sense among these groups um, as opposed to the fairly crude way that we've done it here. And that might speak to that exactly that point. Yeah, these are two cross sections here. So this is CCES basically data. So John, yeah. um, even though we didn't want this to be a Zoom event, we had to uh, allow some of your friends and fans from around the country, we gave them Zoom links. Oh no. And of course, you won't be surprised that Laura Stoker sent in a question and <laughs> I am going to read her question, okay? 
<laughs> and it says, does the calcifying rural urban divide, divide and or the changing relationship of education to partisanship and the vote figure into the new book's story? There you go. That's great. Thank you, Laura. Um, uh, if she's listening, I can tell her that when we moved to Tennessee from Washington, D.C. to take this job at Vanderbilt, you can go through some boxes and clear out some stuff. And I cleared out a big grad school box. And there was a copy of the draft of my dissertation with Laura Stoker's comments on it that she wrote. And if you've ever had comments from Laura Stoker, you know they were substantial. Um, and uh, she would start on the margins of a page, and she'd write around the margin of the page. And then she would flip the page, and she would continue writing on the back. And that was that page. And then the next page, you know. So thank you, Laura. Um, so I would say yes to the, so I want to say a couple things about that. So um, part of what they're, part of the rearranging, obviously, that's happening is correlated with education. It's correlated with people's, um, uh, whether they live in these rural or urban places. I think of those as proxies for political ideas, though, or, or values, or issue attitudes, or something of that nature. The reason why um, college-educated voters have been shifting to the Democratic Party and less voters that don't have college education have been shifting in the opposite direction is, I think of it as because they have different views about issues like particularly race. Um, I can show a slide um, from my reservoir. You can see there are lots. This is from identity crisis. This is the relationship between uh, the percentage who voted for Trump and the five, so typical five category measure of educational attainment with no controls in a statistical model. So just a bivariate relationship, you know, you see what you would expect, right? Which is like Trump support is higher among people with less formal education and lower among people who have a college degree or a postgraduate degree. Then you take a, a model and you account for two variables, which is your view of African-Americans and your view of illegal immigrants. And that relationship disappears. Educational polarization to me is largely a polarization in racial attitudes. Um, so in some sense, that, so the answer to Laura's question in that sense is yes, it figures into our story. Um, we don't lean on education a lot, in part because, again, I think it's a it's just a crude proxy, and also because education is people project all this meaning on edu onto education, like and they talk about working class or white working class, and that makes oh it must be about economics then or, you know, manufacturing losses and trade and a bunch of other stuff. And I prefer to think of um, education as more a proxy for these values and ideas, and I think that's what the rural urban divide is oftentimes picking up as well. Um, people are sorting themselves more reliably into parties on the basis of these beliefs that they probably had for a long time, but now are increasingly diagnostic in the way that they should think about the two parties. And that creates these rural urban divides. I mean, as we all know, this advantages the Republican Party more than the Democratic Party because of the electoral rules that govern how we elect presidents and how we elect the Senate. Um, but to me, that's how I would factor those things into the story, Laura. Thank you. Thanks, John. Big fan of the identity crisis. So cool to see this follow up Thank you. to it. And, um, so just piggybacking on the last comment about education and racial attitudes, just wanted you to say maybe a few words about the diploma divide that we're seeing among Latino. My understanding is we see that also among Latino and mm -hmm. to some extent black voters. And so do you think it's that a rate, you know, does the racial story hold there? And then but then that was just inspired by this. The broader question I wanted yeah. to ask is, you know, lots of discussion about, you know, popularism, democratic strategy, well, you know, and just wanted to get your take. I don't like that terminology, you know, on that particular framing, but any thoughts you have about, you know, what kinds of, in light of all this stuff you've done over these years, what kinds of strategies are more likely sure. to be effective? Sure. Um, my strong suspicion is that, yeah, I mean, that education, people of different educational um, levels have um, differences about issues like race and immigration among all different race and ethnic groups. Um, you know, but I don't have a, a good set of data like at my fingertips to really show you or confirm that. Um, but I think that's right. I mean, and I'm certainly sympathetic to thinking about um, these, the dynamics that we're observing whether we're talking about the diploma divide or other things, I, I, I do, I'm very sympathetic to the idea of thinking about them as, as, as having some diagnostic value among different racial and ethnic groups. So that's my hypothesis in answer to your question. 
um, popularism. Um, for those of you who are smart and don't pay a lot of attention to online debates about um, the future of the Democratic Party, um, popularism is an idea um, that has been put forth by um, a handful of, uh, I think, sort of democratic writers and strategists that say that basically the, the problem for the Democratic Party, um, which was visible in the defund the police debate in 2020, um, was that they oftentimes appear to espouse um, unpopular ideas and unpopular ideas um, both um, negatively affect the electoral fortunes of the candidates who say those things, but they also, because we live in a nationalized era, affect the way that people perceive party brands. And so it doesn't matter if Joe Biden wants to fund the police, as long as somebody somewhere in the Democratic Party, an activist or elected leader is saying we should defund the police, then that's going to hurt Joe Biden. That's a series of empirical hypotheses that have been made. Um, my view is that those are interesting hypotheses, um, but there's not a great deal of data behind some of them. I think the best data that we have about popularism is just some evidence that at least at the congressional level, more ideologically extreme candidates appear to do worse than more centrist candidates. Although that penalty seems to have shrunk over time. You know that research, of course. Um, I think for presidents, it's not clear to me it makes a heck of a lot of difference. Um, we have a really, um, uh, an argument in the, the second chapter of the book that one of the things that was true for Donald Trump when he came into office is if you looked at the things that he wanted to do that were articulated in his campaign, there were a set of things that were popular among Republicans, but also popular among Americans overall. And infrastructure is a good example of that, or parental leave. There's a set of things that are popular among Republicans, but not so much among Americans overall. That's the border wall and a bunch of other stuff like that. What does Trump do? What, what's it, what are his first executive actions, right? It's all the unpopular stuff. What happens to his approval rating? Not much. Biden comes into office. Biden proposes a bunch of stuff that is much more popular on net and a number of things that are popular with upwards of 40%, maybe 50% of Republicans as well. Some of those things pass. Biden's approval rating goes down. You know, And I, again, like counterfactually, I mean, I don't know. Like in a world in which we have a botched withdrawal from Afghanistan, and a punishing inflation rate, and also Joe Biden decides to eliminate federal funding for police departments. I guess his popularity could have gone down more, but like, from from my from my vantage point, it's not so easy to show a one-to-one -one relationship between saying popular things or doing popular things and benefiting from those things. I mean, of course, if I was paid money to tell Biden what to do, I would say don't say unpopular things. I mean, I, I guess, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't suggest that the upside is necessarily going to be immediate, visible, or significant to those things. So I, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's a frustrating debate, um, in part because um, figuring out what popularism means is tricky. Figuring out what evidence we would need to assess it is therefore tricky, and what evidence we do have, I think, is incomplete. Um, and at the end of the day, I just I, I have a lot of uncertainty about whether that's a that's really going to move the needle a great deal. Um, for a population, for a pop, for a politician like the president, in particular. So, for what it's worth, Terry. Um, great, thanks, John. I wanted to hear a little bit more about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, we heard from Diana Mutz last year about that. That was one significant uh, factor that moved voters toward Joe Biden. I wanted to hear what you have to say about the Black Lives Matter and its effect on the 2020 election. I would love to talk about that. Thank you. Um, that's not a planted question. Um, <laughs> wait, I want to say a few things about that. All right, so graph, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Where is it? Um, there is, um, I'll find it in a sec. Um, don't, that's a problem, by the way. Democrats do have problems with low identifying Latinas. Um, so the, um, that's the graph I want. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you four, four, four stories here about that subject of the constitute the body of evidence that we're able to muster. Story number one, what is the immediate effect of Black Lives Matter protests on the horse race? I've taken the graph you saw before and I've added Biden, Biden's lead in trial heat polls based on the polling averages. Okay, right, George Floyd is murdered on May the 23rd or 25th, 26th, something like that. I should remember that date. All right, now, I mean, I'm a social scientist. I'm not gonna say that's a causal relationship, right? But I'm gonna say that in the moment in which there was the, the, the most attention 
right, to what happened to George Floyd and to the racial justice protests, Biden's lead over Trump increased. And now, that, I mean, we know that the polls overestimated Biden's vote share. I'm not sure though that that would suggest that that <laughs> increase is some artifact, right? I think it's meaningful and it persists for the most part until the end. It's just a funny story to me if you think that the Black Lives Matter movement or these protests were hurting Biden that, you know, you just didn't see it like in the, in the simplest place you could find it. Um, the second story has to do with the protests themselves and what the effect of having protests. Um, and there was a lot of speculation about, are these protests, what, uh, it, what's the right analogy here? Is it 1968 all over again? And that was a, a very much a, a, a conversation where people wondered if having protests that were accompanied by violence, of course, that violence is not just perpetrated by protesters, it's perpetrated by sort of instigators who just use the protests, it's, it's perpetrated by the police in some of these protests. But nevertheless, protests happen, there is violence at the protest. Is that gonna hurt Democrats the way that some research suggests that it happened in 1968? Um, this is the difference between Biden's vote share and Clinton's vote share in counties that had no protests counties that had protests, but there was no recorded arrest, injury, damage at the protest, counties with arrests, injuries, and or damage recorded at the protest. This is based on the Crowd Counting Consortium's data, which is a crowdsourced platform for counting um, political protest events in the Trump era. They recorded hundreds, if not thousands, of, of racial justice protests. And you can see that there's, of course, a lot of variation within each group of counties, but you can also see what the averages are. Relative to Clinton, Biden does better in counties that had these protests, and it does not matter whether the protests were accompanied by violence or not. And that is true, not just controlling for Clinton's vote share, it's controlling for a bunch of other demographic characteristics in these counties. Um, one of the things we've highlighted in the third group of counties is Kenosha, um, because of the Rittenhouse shooting, the shooting of um, Blake, and then the Rittenhouse shooting Right? And that was, a, there's a very famous economist piece um, that argued that Biden lost vote share in Kenosha. And the, the, the further away you go from the, where the, the protest occurred in Kenosha, the, the, the smaller that penalty gets, right? So it seems very localized. And we would not disagree with that characterization of Kenosha. However, to focus on Kenosha, but not talk about Hennepin County, <laughs> Minnesota, when Minneapolis is, or Multoma, where like the Portland ongoing stuff is occurring, is to sort of, I think, cherry pick a little bit the story. Um, we are very careful to say, as you would imagine, that we do not suggest that there's a causal connection, although there is literature arguing that racial justice protests do help Democrats. Daniel Gilliam's book, Ryan Enos's work on the Rodney King protests, right? So it's consistent with that work, but to me, it's just not the argument that people thought. It's not consistent with the argument that people thought. Third piece of evidence. We can regress people's vote intentions and in survey data, or we can regress county level election outcomes, not just on the volume of advertising that you saw or was aired in your media market, but we can separate out the Trump attacks on Biden, on crime and public safety and Black Lives Matter. And there's no relationship between Trump's attacks on Biden in these ads, which aired hundreds of thousands of times in certain media markets at certain parts of the fall and spring. Um, and there's no relationship. So I'm again, I mean, I've done those advertising models a lot. I'm not think they're not the most powerful, like, you know, costly identified in research design, but you would expect to see a correlation if like that was what was happening. We don't see it. I, I don't know about congressional races where many members of Congress and the Democratic side thought that these ads hurt them or the message hurt them, but I, I don't see it at the presidential level. And then the, fi the final thing that we argue and admittedly, I can't argue this with reference to questions about policing specifically, like should we have more body cameras or should we ban chokeholds or uh, should we defund or find other ways to decrease the scope of police work by like hiring police, other people to do traffic enforcement or whatever. I don't have those questions like in a panel data setup, but the questions that we do have Black Lives Matter and views of the police, the graph I showed you before, but the fact that people's partisanship predicts their views on those those groups, right, much more than the views on those groups predict their partisanship. I think the, it's not quite clear to me where, which direction the causal arrow is running here. So if you're the theory that the about the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement or the protest or the issues associated with it is fundamentally a story where the issues drive people's voting, 
I think if anything, it's the reverse um, more so. Now, does that mean there's no one, no voter anywhere in any district or state in this country that you know had their mind changed because of the debate about uh, Black Lives Matter and defund the police or whatever, you, however you want to define it? I, I'm, I'm sure there might be some, um, but for the most part, the way that we like the, the way that I always like telling stories like this in the book because you know all you can say is we can't find good evidence for it. Doesn't mean there's not evidence, um, but I think the evidence that we have doesn't suggest that there was. Typical, it certainly was not 1968, as far as we can tell from the evidence that we're able to muster. And this graph is just is one example of it. Please do not, this is the graph I don't want in the public domain yet, because I don't want to have that debate yet. I'd like the book to come out, and then we can talk about this graph. But so, shh, people on Zoom, shh. But that, that's what we find. Thanks, Jason. You want to? Right. So he asked the question like, what is the, how do we, how do we square the story with calcification, right? I, the way I squared is on average, there are very small shifts, right? Is the, are, is there, are there the variation in those shifts, right, related to characteristics? Yes. Okay. Um, the percent Latino is a good predictor of which way a county shifted, right? There is a small relationship to the presence of these protests net of other factors. Um, so you, to me, like you can have calcification on average, but also have um, variation that creates, that you can explain with our other characteristics. So that's how I'd square that circle. So to try to tie together a few threads here, I'm just thinking about kind of Eric's questions and some of what we've been talking about. I'm kind of thinking about the example of, of like Joe Manson as a, as a motivating example of this question where, you know, I think if you, if you took the calcification story like very literally to its extremes, you would not predict what you see, which is that Joe Manchin is like actually fairly popular in West Virginia. Like you have all these Republicans that are like, we love what Joe Manchin is doing. Um, and uh, there's a lot of reasons they could like what he's doing. But I guess to me, that example strikes, like makes me a little more skeptical of like the pure fatalism of Biden's. Um, you know, maybe, maybe it's just totally different, right? But it, it seems like there's something that a politician can do that like makes your home state like you, even when like they have all these reasons to not given your party affiliation, et cetera. So I wonder like the, I guess my like to abstract from that, um, you know, I'm curious how much you think this calcification is driven by something happening among voters versus like, I guess my, the interpretation I would have of this is more like the Mo Fiorina interpretation, which is you have Democrats moving to the left quite a bit. You have Republicans moving to the right quite a bit. And then you have all of these voters who are there for like the choices are more clear to them. And it's, un, you know, maybe they've moved some on some things like the immigration stuff, whatever. But I, I guess I could interpret this calcification as reflecting more of like voters are staying in place and they're reacting to what elites are doing. And that, and that to me suggests like less fatalism about what Biden could do. It's just like, it's hard to imagine Biden doing that much, things that are that different than what he's doing now, because we look among Democrats and you're like, well, how many different things are Democrats doing? And it's like, well, they're, they're all doing the same thing, except for like one or two of them who it turns out have like very different, you know, approval rating numbers than the rest. Yeah. Um, so I, I am curious about that. I think yeah, Manchin's like a, a way to kind of get at that. Um, just kind of what you think about that, like how much of this is just reactions to elite, you know, extremism yeah. and homogeneity and that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I think a lot of it is is a, is elite driven. So I think if I mean I think I'm in 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 the same camp as Fiorina. I mean, voters are reacting to the choices that they're given. Um, I. And I mean, I, and I, I acknowledge that the story of where those choices come from in terms of, of the elite politics is a complicated story involving not just elected leaders, but activist groups and the like. Um, but I do think that that's what the voters are reacting to. Um, so that begs the question, right, can politicians do something different? Um, and then what's the treatment effect, right, of that strategy, essentially? Um, and I think you're. I think you're, I think it's appropriate to like to think of it in the way that you do because there's not a lot of politicians walk off the equilibrium path, as it were, within their party. And I think that's true for Biden, and that's true for a lot of Democrats. So I guess we don't really know. Manchin is a is an interesting counterexample to that. Um, and I think we'll get a really good sense of sort of what the potential benefit is when he gets to run for re-election in a couple of years and see what what difference all of this made at the end of the day. Um, one of the things why one of the things why I oftentimes think of the of, of these dynamics as self-reinforcing, particularly at the elite level, is because 
it's not clear where where the where the incentive comes from to change like to change your behavior and so i think you can see with biden like there's always he's you know he's 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 got to watch his left flank all the time or he seems to want to watch his left flank all the time so he's very well maybe that's right but he has but he seems not to want to you know to be, he seems to be very risk averse and as 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 other democrats do um in that regard a uh, mansion can afford not to be clearly because the median voter is different in west virginia than it is elsewhere but I, and i think the same thing's true on the republican side too um you know it's not quite clear to me that there are good incentives i mean this is to the quote from paul and eric at the end of the presentation there's not good incentives to would encourage elected leaders to make different or better choices and so as a result right you know um re republicans get what they get the vote, voters get what they get um and we have a lot of evidence you know in the book on COVID and other issues where there's a lot of elite led public opinion um in a very john zoller sense um so i i for me that that is an amplification of your point that i think a lot of this is grounded in the choices that elites make um and the, the way in which elites therefore are sort of in you know in a dance with the whether it's conservative news media figures or other kinds of activists in the party and voters are just kind of left with what that what what that gives them um yeah i wish we had more joe mansions just to sort of see what like create more variation in the independent variable and then we could do yeah. gabe thanks well, all right. thanks for the uh great great talk and awesome series of books so much fantastic data collection and um one i have many many questions but the one that's on my mind the sort of most is that if you were to uh say before i don't know 2016 or so that there'd be uh, of any republican candidate here's the one that would really calcify the republican party and the whole electoral system you wouldn't put trump anywhere near you know the top of that list and as a president, I don't think he has been anywhere near the top of the list as like the most conventional, typical Republican. In fact, he's one of the weirdest candidates, presidents we've ever had in the whole history of the United States um, and maybe many other Western industrial uh, uh, democracies. Um, and yet, uh, you know, massive deficit uh, spend, spending, just to name one of the many ways in which he's a, you know, very weird Republican. Um, and yeah, we see the perceptions of him growing that he's conservative on, on all, you know, all, the, all these issues, which you showed us, which is kind of uh, fascinating. And we see this, as you've talked about, incredible calcification, you know, no sign of county or state level shifts that might be picking up on that. Um, and I'm just wondering how you think about all that and square. square yeah, I mean, I, there's no question that I, the word I would use is to, I'll use a more polite word, which Trump is unconventional in a variety of senses, um, weird maybe. Um, but I guess, I mean, at the end of the day, like, you know, Trump is a, is, Trump rearranges political norms of different kinds, right? He gives politicians a sense that you can behave personally in a way that is different than how most politicians behave. Even fairly hard-nosed ideologues behave just in terms of his personal rudeness, you know, and 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 the like. Um, but it, I mean, when we sort of sat down and took stock of his presidency from a policy standpoint, well, yeah, okay, on trade. Right. I mean, he certainly breaks with a Chamber of Commerce style Republican. Uh, but on abortion, on guns, on judges, on taxes, on discretionary spending in the federal budget, which he wanted to cut so drastically that even the congressional Republicans balked at it. Um, on immigration, he is more conservative than some Republicans, but he's there's certainly a pretty significant faction that would agree with him on those issues. So again, he's he, if he, he either he is. I think acting in the way a Republican or a conservative Republican would act if he is picking a side within the party is oftentimes picking the more conservative side within the party, except perhaps on trade. At the end of the day, you know, it really struck me that the party changed Trump as much as Trump changed the party, or, you know, when you, but again, it depends on what domain you want to look at. I think our sense of the policy domain is that he, he acts like a pretty conservative Republican. And that is because he did not, I don't think, has a lot of strong ideological commitments. 
He has commitments on trade and, and immigration because he's espoused those for years. Um, he has certainly had a, a, a racially inflammatory past that dates to the Central Park Five, if not before. Um, but you know, you could see him pivot on on tax increases on the wealthy, or decrease to, you know from tax increases on the wealthy, which he floated in the campaign to tax decreases on the wealthy. I mean, you know, and a lot of stuff. He really came on board with where the party was, and he had been doing some of that even before. I mean, he he got his career started, you know, by you know, shifting from kind of being a nonpartisan sort of play both sides of the aisle. What did he say at one point? You know, it, it doesn't, it's something like if it doesn't matter if it's a Democrat or Republican, if all you need is a zoning decision, you know, like a real estate developer type decision. But then, you know, he kind of, he, when he became kind of a Republican party actor, he's, he really, he got in line. I thought he might be different on LGBT, but then he went after transgender in the military within the first few months of his presidency. So, and I don't, again, I assume that this, the train is not always being driven by Trump here. You know, it's being driven by the, the ideological figures that he accumulated around him, whether it be Stephen Miller or Jeff Sessions or any of them. But to me, that's, that's why I think of him as being a calcifying figure, or at least a re, he's at least reinforcing things, you know, to some extent. Jack, do you want to ask the question I fear you want to ask? Well, a version of it. I okay. warned you about this. Um, you know, write, you write these three books of three different elections. And by the end of 2020 election, there are all of these tons of books and articles and you cite Eric and Paul's yeah. piece, uh, you know, threat to democracy. We're on the verge of becoming, I don't know what, Venezuela or something like that. And I think, you know, my own view is that there's a lack of specificity to a lot of those arguments, although not in Eric and Paul's quotes, it's very direct. I want to sort of actually use that to take off. And I asked you this before, you know, we can always do what if counterfactual. Now, what if Mitt Romney had won the 2012 election? Would we be having this kind of a discussion about the threat to democracy or not? There would have been no Trump. He would run for re-election. He would have won or lost. And, uh, you know, the whole whole tenor might have been different. Maybe it would have been the same. And it goes really to the point of your four points, which I only remember three, but I do remember <laughs> tectonic change yeah. and calcification. Now, those are long-term, yep. slow, steady, embedded yep. phenomena. And then you have the identity question, right? The salience. Mm -hmm. When you, mm -hmm. you talked about five-year yeah. salience in television, yep. which I confess they were engaging Yep. Some people totally disagree with you, but I think, you know, because they view this racist thing as a turning point in America in 2021. So, so um, yeah, but still, um, if we, if, so it's just kind of a more general analytical question. What is the balance here uh, between these tectonic, embedded, hard to see changing phenomena yeah. and contingency, such as, you know, a close election. I mean, yeah. the uh, Romney election turned out not to be close. A lot of people thought he would have had a chance to win at some point. And, you know, you call it a gamble that lost or won whoever yeah. side you're on. So I, I think that, um, you know, the bitter end, the threat to democracy is how, uh, you know, how deeply yep. rooted in what's going on is that or is that more of a contingent thing which nonetheless important sure. and real sure. because obviously trump was real and we had to suffer through yep. that I, yeah i have a i have um I, you know what the what if romney had won in 2012 questions a fun exercise in counterfactual history it reminds me of that i have a book on my shelf that was i think edited by our colleague Nelson Polsby, our late colleague Nelson Polsby called What If? Um, and we don't do a lot of what ifs in political science like this. But I would, I think you're right to say that it would be very different because, you know, the chances of Romney getting reelected in 2016, and given the economy of 2016, is pretty good. And so you don't need to have a Trump candidacy. It's not clear to me Trump would have emerged without the, the relatively wide open field of 2016. Um, it's not clear to me Trump would have emerged if he hadn't had four more years of the Barack Obama presidency to use as the launching pad for like a you know, a, a, a political career founded in birtherism, you know. Um, 
And then, you know, um, I don't know what that implies exactly for, for 2020 in terms of, you know, with an open seat in the White House, but it does strike me that you would not have had Trump at the helm of the Republican Party. Uh, and so that to me would mean that, yes, there would be a lot um, less of a challenge to American democracy. One of the things that we've tried to do in these books, and this is not something you can do systematically with, with data sets and the like, but we've tried to emphasize that the outcomes that we see are not just the result of structural forces, but they are the result of choices that politicians make. And so in 2016, we talk about the choices that you know politicians make like Trump to talk about race and, and immigration in the way that he does. Other Republicans didn't talk about it that way. Other Republicans objected when he talked about it that way during the primary campaign, but he won anyway. So that's what we got. Similarly, in the wake of the 2020 election, right? I mean, you know, we point out the Republicans that obviously that criticized Trump for his behavior. Liz Cheney would be the, the most you know, well-known example. Romney is another one. But the point is that, like, you know, after Clinton lost, she conceded. After Romney lost, he conceded. Like, they didn't create, they didn't challenge democracy. So to me, there's, it's, it's nothing that is going to inexorably bubble up from the public. Um, and it's nothing that's inexorably baked into polarization or calcification or any of those kinds of words. Um, at the end of the day, I think it, it is, the, it is, it is it maybe that those trends facilitate these kinds of behavior in the ways that Eric and Paul are describing, but it strikes me that, again, it's at the end of the day, it's the choice the leader makes. Um, and so kind of the way we've closed both books, the, the note we continue to try to end on is basically saying, like, this is, this is what, it's, what it's going to take is for leaders to make different choices. Um, and I think that not just is about like if Trump runs again and loses, will he concede the election? But it also has to do with the way whether other Republican policymakers, what they're going to do in that circumstance. Um, you know, we have a very specific idea of what the biggest challenge to democracy is. Um, and it's the fact that there are a substantial number of, of um, Republican office holders and candidates that seem willing to find ways to change the outcome, um, whether that's having state legislators substitute alternative slates of electors. Right, or whatever it is. Um, so to us, that's the big challenge. That's, that only exists because Trump pushed that idea and continues to push that idea. So, you know, maybe we should risk for a Romney victory in 2012, you know, in terms of the, the you know, where we, where, we, where we ended up today. But to me, that's the important way um, that we try to, I don't know if I call it contingency because we're not really thinking about it in terms of like events like COVID, which we can't anticipate, but we do think that there is, that, that there is agency here, I guess is the word we would use. Politicians have agency, they can make choices. Of course, those choices are influenced by their views of voters and public opinion and other kinds of forces, but nevertheless, like different politicians make different choices, even when they're in their same party, looking at the same electorate, you know, and the same structural forces. And so we think that it's right to sort of point those choices out. And to the extent that these books have any kind of normative edge to them amidst all the empirical data, it's because we have, you know, concerns about the choices that politicians have made. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all.